People often ask, what, what does it mean to teach well? What are we talking about when we say to teach well? I think this comes back to the question of instructor-centered versus student-centered teaching. Student-centered teaching, for me, is an attitude more than anything else about how to go about preparing to teach a class and how to actually teach it. And uh, when I used to lecture uh, traditionally, I spent a lot of time uh, preparing for class. A lot of work went into it. But what I was thinking about always was, what am I going to do first in the first five minutes? And then what am I going to do after that? And then what slide am I going to show? And so on. And the student-centered approach, you're turning it around and asking, what are the students going to be doing during the first five minutes? What are they going to be doing during the next five minutes? What's going to happen after I show, give them this problem? So that it's, the focus is on what the students are doing in the class and not on the professor. So to start understanding sex differentiation, we're going to watch one more video, and then you're going to work on a, a, an assignment alone and in groups. I want you to start, there's some reading at the top, and then I want you to work on number one, which is on the front. Just ignore number two for now. You're going to want to make sure number one's in good shape first. Um, I want you to work on it alone to start with. to work in groups. I want you to discuss your figures and come to some sort of agreement about what they should look like. genes that code for the production of receptors on target cells, remember back to your analogies now when you were learning about how hormones work, the receptors on the target cells for malarian inhibitory substance are dysfunctional. So to have the SRY gene, um, it's going to develop testes as normal. There's nothing in this uh, description that says testes won't develop. So we expect testosterone um, to be developed in, as it would in a normal male. Um, however, and it, the malarian uh, substance, inhibiting substance is being produced as well, but remember from when we talked about, first started talking about hormones, that an endocrine cell produces a hormone, it travels through the bloodstream, and then it bonds to a receptor on a target cell, 
And that is what starts the cascade that leads to the response in the cell. Questions about that? Yes? I didn't know the answer to that. My guess would be probably not. The question was, would he be able to reproduce? Blind in the center of the Just for one second, because pretty much everybody has just written promoter. Promoter is not enough, right? It's from what species is your promoter and what genes that promoter usually go with. I think we all kind of took it for granted, like the project. Right. And I think those are the Okay, so briefly here we've got um, the, the example of DNA entering the cell somewhat passively, though there's a little bit of a channel there to help facilitate this, and it's not a very efficient process. To understand that the way we get around the inefficiency is by making our plasma have what? What's, what do we make our plasma have? People have it, anyone? To make it to overcome the total inefficiency of our transformation procedure. There we go. Pull out the microphone. That's the specific thing we do. What a selectable the marker. What's that? A selectable marker. Okay. We make sure our plasma has a selectable marker, and that selectable marker could be ampicillin resistance, or tetracycline resistance, or gamma resistance. It's a gene that encodes a protein that allows that bacterium to not be killed. Antibiotics. That would be a classic kind of selectable marker. And if you then douse the bacteria with that antibiotic, you can be sure that this is a very good thing to have. We've been emphasizing in this series the importance and the value of active learning. But that's not to say that lecturing is completely worthless. Uh, a good lecture can be inspiring. It can communicate information that's not in the textbook or the resources that a student has available. The problem is that it's not sufficient. That uh, the things we want students to be able to do 
at the end of a course are uh, analyzed besides learning content. We want them to be able to analyze data. We want them to be able to draw conclusions and critically evaluate data. We want them to be able to solve problems. And those are things that require practice. So that's what, we, one of the, that's what lecture does not do. It doesn't give the students the opportunity to practice the skills that most instructors would like students to develop. Sometimes people equate teaching with transmitting information. And teaching is much more than that. Uh, I think to us, those of us in this project, good teaching means eliciting productive behavior from students and helping them grapple with problems and learn how to solve problems and so on, not simply transmitting information. It's, it's, I mean, it's something I think about a lot, I guess, because I do have a lot of goals to always push, I guess, how I teach the class towards active learning and me talking less. But, you know, in reality, if I counted the time, I'd probably be like a three and a half or a four. Like, I have a lot of room to improve still. And um, I guess it's in, important to keep in mind that you don't have to be a five either, right? So, um, you know, it's, uh, and maybe some days you're closer to one end than another. I think that something that's important is you have to really think about the goals for your class and how can you meet that objective or outcome, whatever phrase you want to put on it. And is active learning really the best way? It may, it may not be. Um, but if it is, it's worth a try, right? That's a difficult, actually it's a difficult number for me to give myself because I think I'm student-centered in that. Like, I will not teach until I know that they understand something. I want them to think, right? And I know that active learning is the way to get there. And I'm implementing stuff, but I'm not where I need to be. So maybe a two and a half. But I've done a lot of active learning by my standards, so I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I'm happy. Like, I can do more, but I've, I've done way more than I've ever done. So. So I think for my big intro courses, you know, sadly, I'm probably still at like a two <laughs> um, in terms of I'm, you know, it's still there's quite a bit of lecture um, and it shouldn't be that way. <laughs> and so my goal would be to move that maybe not to a five, but to maybe a four, um, because I, I do think there is a role for um I don't know. I don't know if this this makes sense, but I, I, a, a role for sort of being a, a role model for the material, sort of in how you talk about the material in a way you model how one should think about the material. I think in my upper division courses where I've had more experience letting go, um, I mean, I would never give myself a five. I, I, there's always room for improvement, but... Um, yeah, I'd give myself a four, maybe. In the large enrollment course, yeah, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm about as traditional as you can be right now. So I'm hoping to break out of that. Um, but I, I mean, other than the fact that I use clickers, I'm just like everybody else that you know taught me. Um, so I got to get out of that. So I give myself about a two. I, I, I need to swing that pendulum. I don't let students drive the curriculum entirely. I have wisdom, I have knowledge of what I think they need to know and be able to do, and I use that to set the scope of the curriculum and the depth of the content generally. So I wouldn't say that I'm entirely student-centered. However, um, I, I think that I engage them a lot in their learning and I try to use examples and let what they do in class guide what I do instructionally. So I would say that I'm probably between a three and a four. I, I think I, 
This sounds really conceited, but I think I'm, I'm pretty darn close to that five. Uh, I, I'm thinking of what I do with, with freshman seminar courses, and I don't teach upper division or graduate courses right now, but when I did, um, for me it was so much about what do the students need to learn and want to learn. And my approach was always, here are some topics that I think you need to learn. These are critical to understand this course. But usually at least half the course was student choice. 